We're here at the cemetery because this is our family plot. And our family goes back here from the 1850s, actually. And so it's, it's Sacramento is a very near and dear place to my heart. But Catherine had no idea she would spend her mother's final days fighting in one of Sacramento's powerful institutions, our probate court. It was like the Wild West out there. The probate law is so complicated and it's really hard to follow. Matter 29 in the matter of May. Morning, Your Honor. Mark Blake appearing on behalf of the matter petitioner. Number 19. We file a response to the calendar matter notes last week. Number one in 20. Department 129 handles all probate matters in Sacramento County, from estate proceedings to trusts to conservatorships, roughly 100 cases per week. In 2013, one of those was Catherine's mom, who was placed under a conservatorship. So basically right after my dad died and I'm, you know, all of a sudden I'm having to deal with court, you know, our family's fighting, my mom being conserved. A conservatorship is when the probate court appoints another person to have legal authority over someone's life when they cannot take care of themselves. They can be fast hearings for the amount of power provided over another person. We have the right to decide where we live, to make our own medical decisions, to decide who we talk to. When you are put under conservatorship, you lose that. A variety of people can be appointed conservator, including relatives. But if family members aren't getting along... When you bring this into court, it's no longer just a family squabble. With feuding families, the probate court may lean towards appointing an outside person to serve as conservator. And that frequently is a professional fiduciary. This professional fiduciary serves as an unbiased third-party conservator. The California Probate Code says the proposed conservatee must attend the hearing, but exceptions are made for a number of things, including if they're unwilling to or medically unable. This means that sometimes they aren't part of the decision being made on their behalf. In a lot of cases, the court never sees that proposed conservatee. That's where the court investigator comes in. The probate investigator brought a real-time snapshot of what's going on. After a petition for a conservatorship is filed, a court investigator interviews the conservatee. They observe their physical and mental state to see if conservatorship is needed. First and foremost, for the judge to have as balanced and concise a report of what we observed. Jim was a court investigator in the Sacramento County Probate Court from 1980 till 2009. Throughout his career, he says there were multiple circumstances of an increase in cases and decrease in funding of certain entities like public guardians. A, a backlog was created. It became a matter of, do we have enough resources to do it all? And the answer was no. It's not the judge's fault, but might have a one-hour calendar with 80 matters before him or her. The person becomes used to hearing the same story over and over again, and pretty soon it's easy to dehumanize it. We treat all the people that come before the court respectfully, but we have a calendar that requires that if we spend a lot of time on one matter, that, that could potentially affect how much time we spend on another. In the book Guardianships and the Elderly, The Perfect Crime, author Dr. Sam Sugar says significant money can be made by court insiders who know how to play the public system. And our investigation found two significant ways that appear to be loopholes around court regulations and oversight. The first is ex parte petitions, also known as emergency petitions. The probate code requires each party have 15 days for evaluations from a doctor and court inspector after a petition of a conservatorship is filed. But if an emergency petition is filed, it's a different story. So you go in with an ex parte petition. In some counties, you have to give 48 hours notice. Some counties, you just go in and do it. In Sacramento County, ex partes are in the event of an emergency and must be submitted at least 24 hours in advance of the desired hearing time. You have to say there's a reason why we have to move this up on the calendar. And is a court investigator still required to investigate when it's an ex parte? I don't believe they are. So they don't have to do an investigation. 
Carol Kelly says it was an emergency petition that placed her mother under a conservatorship. One, she says, was based on unverified allegations. The petition was written by Carolyn Young herself that contained false information. According to court documents, an ex parte petition was filed by fiduciary Carolyn Young after an anonymous call was made to Adult Protective Services saying Mary Jane Mann was at risk of abuse from one of her daughters, Carol. This led to Mary Jane Mann being placed under a temporary conservatorship of Young. These were wild, wild accusations that were written up to justify her taking control of my mother. Court documents reveal Carol's sister appeared to be in favor of the conservatorship and had concerns about Carol, alleging she was isolating their mother from her. A, a wedge was put between us. It did not help my mother. It, it, I can't tell you how hard it is to watch someone you love have to suffer. Court records show their mother said she was perfectly capable of managing her own financial affairs. Two years after the conservatorship was appointed, Mann sued for civil rights violations. In a binding settlement and agreement that was reached with Young and her legal counsel, the conservatorship was dissolved with the agreement that Mann dropped the suit. Carol believes this conservatorship was never needed, and it took a financial and emotional toll on her mother. I have no doubt that Carolyn Young's actions took years off of my mother's life. Young refused our many requests for an on-camera interview, but answered some of our questions in writing. When we asked about Mann's mental capabilities, Young said in part that there is no basis in fact for Carol Kelly's opinions and noting multiple times that she follows the direction of the court. The second loophole around the probate court is through the trust. It might be because the maker of that trust doesn't have a close relative that they feel like they can depend upon, so they interview a professional fiduciary. Once you petition the court to get on the trust, it's the end of the court's oversight. The trust has basically three or four parties. It has the maker of the trust, the trustee who is in charge of assets and applying directions to the trust, and beneficiary who is supposed to benefit from assets in the trust. It's set up in a way where oversight is written in. And because you have that, it doesn't have to go through a probate court. While that can help avoid expensive legal fees, it can also be detrimental if the trustee doesn't execute it in the way the maker of the trust wanted. Specifically here in Sacramento, Jim saw how using the trust changed the conservatorship business. The legal community moved away from the oversight that was inherent in the conservatorship process. He believes a combination of resources tightening within the public guardian's office plus going around the court with trusts was how the conservatorship business evolved from public to private. Their fees and the fees of their private fiduciary clients had to be approved by the court. So a workaround is that if the trust is set up in such a way that there's no review, you charge what fees you want, then you get your fees automatically. In the 80s, Jim says there was a mass exit of a group of professionals from the Sacramento County Probate Court to the private side. Carolyn Young, who was at the Public Guardians, she was one of the first private fiduciaries that I had ever heard of. And it was the start of a successful business for Young. I think she's the leading licensed fiduciary in Sacramento. According to annual statements to the Professional Fiduciary Bureau, in her 2020 statement, Carolyn Young reported managing over $111 million. The other fiduciaries in her business are her two children, Zach Young and Lindsay Bowman. For 2020, Zach reported managing $135 million, and Lindsay reported managing over $30 million. Altogether, that's nearly $277 million of other people's assets Carolyn, Zach, and Lindsay of the Young Fiduciary Business manage. Fiduciaries handle a lot of money. According to the Professional Fiduciary Bureau, around $13 billion of other people's assets are handled by fiduciaries in California alone. In a statement to us, Young said in 35 years as a professional fiduciary, she's handled over a thousand cases. She also said that those cases have involved several thousand reports to the court for review of my actions. In no case has the court or the professional fiduciary bureau ever found that I've breached my fiduciary duties. We combed through those probate court cases and we found a pattern, the same attorneys working with Young. 
The continuing education of the bar's California conservatorship practice says most courts will not appoint an attorney for a proposed conservatee if that same attorney has represented the conservator in other cases. From January 2010 to September 2020, we discovered 56 out of 84 cases where a number of the same attorneys represented Young. In 44 of those cases, she was represented by an attorney named Tosh Yamamoto. In the other 12 cases, she was represented by attorneys Leland Ellison, Judy Carver, Todd Roby, and Barbara Bender. We found three out of the 56 cases where these same attorneys who represented Young then represented the conservatee in other cases where Young was petitioning to be conservator. You later kind of find out all the kinds of things and how intertwined it is. Many involved in these cases we spoke with believe when the same attorney represents conservators, conservatees, and even different family members in multiple cases, it's a conflict of interest. It was also part of the reason behind Jamie Lamborn suing and settling with her former attorney, Tosh Yamamoto, because she says he didn't disclose his and Young's previous relationship prior to Young being appointed trustee and conservator of her father. I was suing him, you know, because he, he deserved it. She also filed a complaint with the state bar, which launched an investigation into Yamamoto, but was later dropped. When we showed our findings of the same attorneys working with the same fiduciary to the California State Bar and asked if this qualifies as a conflict of interest, they refused to comment and suggested that we seek an outside expert. So we went to Professor Melissa Brown. Sacramento really is a small legal community. And conservatorship law is complex, making it a smaller number of attorneys who specialize in it. So with the probate court, it's likely you'll see many of the same attorneys handling the same types of cases. She said attorneys cannot represent multiple parties in the same case. That's a clear conflict of interest. But if you finished one case with another fiduciary and a family or the court appoints you in, uh, in another case to represent the proposed conservatee, I don't, I mean, I don't think that's a conflict. The small number of attorneys who specialize in this field here in Sacramento is something we witnessed firsthand. Months after we interviewed Mike Hackard, he began actively investigating a case against Carolyn Young. Does she and the attorneys that work with her kind of have a reputation in the legal community? Well, the, the reputation is generally, if, if she's or members of her family, let's say, are the conservator, you can pretty well guess who are, the attorneys are going to be. And that's a natural thing, probably utilizing the same counsel. The probate court is, it's an old boys, old girls club. But some of the small amount of Sacramento attorneys in this field have not been comfortable when potential clients try to fight the conservatorship system. To find an attorney in Sacramento that doesn't have a conflict with Todd Roby or Carolyn Young or Tosh Yamamoto is impossible. How many do you think you? Ten. Ten. Yeah. And then I had other ones that just wouldn't take it on because it was complicated. I couldn't find any help. Okay, I was just down to the bottom of the barrel. And many we spoke with have lost faith in our judicial system because of this. There is no oversight or accountability. That's what's really sad. Because they know it's wrong and they still do it anyhow and they're still being paid. And that's the problem. You look at the motivation. 